Hi, everyone. My name is John Lane. I'm the Director of Percussion Studies and Professor of Percussion at Sam Houston State University. And we're here with another installment of a series that actually began as a studio class uh, project, which was a, a Percussion Educators Roundtable. And we had so much fun doing it. I had so much fun doing it. And it was great to get to know some of my fellow educators here in Texas that I decided to keep going. So I'm here just with me this time. I've asked my students to submit some questions as well. Uh, but this is going to be the third one in the series. And uh, this week we're going to explore some different topics than our previous ones. And I've got three terrific guests joining me today. First, Andre Zaya received his Bachelor of Music in Music Education and Human Learning from UT Austin. Mr. Aya was a member of the World Champion Cavaliers Drum and Bugle Corps from 2001 to 2003, has served as Assistant Percussion Caption Head and Snare Tech for the Colts Drum and Bugle Corps in 2009 and 10. And as an educator, he served as Director of Percussion Studies for Alvin High School from 2004 to 17, and recently joined the Stephen F. Austin High School uh, band staff in 2017. He's also got a terrific series on YouTube. I'd recommend checking that out. I'll make sure and put it in the, the notes in the, uh, in the show description here. Christina Hurlbut, originally from Highland Village, Texas. Ms. Hurlbut received her bachelor's in music ed and a master's in percussion performance from BYU. She received a number of awards from the Utah chapter of PAS, performed in the Utah Valley Steel Band Festival and joined the Abilene High School band staff as Director of Percussion during the 2017 and 18 school year. And she just recently presented a clinic at TMEA on the topic of beginner percussion. And rounding out our round table, Tyler Sammons, originally from Seguin, Texas. Mr. Sammons attended the University of North Texas for his bachelor's degree and taught extensively in the North Texas area. Mr. Sammons has been heavily involved with DCI, having served as a member and on the percussion staff at the Santa Clara Vanguard, and prior to that, teaching with the Boston Crusaders and as a marching member at the Crossman and Phantom Regiment. He's currently the percussion director at Westlake High School in Austin. Thank you all so much for being here today. I'm really, uh, really, really excited to have you all here. And um, I've got a number of, of questions, and we'll just kind of open up the, open up the discussion and, and see where it goes. Uh, the first one that I think is a, a really interesting one was something that I happened upon with uh, Andres in your uh, YouTube series. And there was a video called uh, The Band Mentality. And, and so I watched that, and I thought it was a really great uh, just sort of talking to the students about all the, all the things that uh, go into the sort of mentality of what one needs to be successful and what one can learn from, uh, from playing music in high school. Uh, so maybe you could lead us off with that one uh, sure. and uh, kind of talk through what, what that means to you. What is the band mentality? Well, the, the original way that I made that video was I was trying to make sure my sixth graders had the right mentality when joining band. Um, as you guys know, starting beginners and, and percussion, you know, we want to make sure those, those students stick it out. We can't just pick a kid out of the hallway and make sure they're, you know, have the right, uh, all the right background that they need to have from middle school to high school. So, you know, basically that's directed at parents and students to have the right mentality before they join my group. Um, I, I want to make sure they know what they're getting into. I, I don't want to say I want to scare them off, but I kind of do after learning through many years that a lot of kids come in and, you know, think they're just going to be a drum set player or they're just going to do percussion or they're not going to do anything else. A lot of times you'll have some parents that'll come in and they have an idea of what they want their student to do. And that's just starting us off on the wrong foot. And I'm just trying to make sure I, I'm being very clear to students and parents of what my expectations are. And although we, we try to have a lot of fun, want to make sure that they understand that you know in band this isn't uh a, this isn't like you know your swim club or something like that where you can it's all about you and it's about you put your money in and you just want to get what you want out of it although you are going to get things out of band that are personal but it's more about the group right so they need to start some of those parents and students need to understand that it's not only about them improving and um but they need to be a good 
a social member, you know, then that's going to make them a better member in society. And, and uh, they have to learn, you know, that we're depending on them. Um, they have to show up to things on time. We are depending on them. You know, I, I often say, you know, as percussionists, yes, you're joining band, but we're basically every part we learn is a solo instrument. And so we have to depend on everybody. Everybody has to be good. We can't leave you behind. Everybody's got, got to come along for the ride. And so I just want to make sure they have the right mentality when they're coming into the program. It's also a good reminder for my seventh and eighth graders of why they joined and, and the reasons why they did and the things that we need from them. Um, but basically for them to understand, you know, they have to have thick skin because you're going to get criticized every day in beginner band. Um, you know, some students, you know, don't come in with the right mindset. They, they think uh, they're just doing it for fun, which we're going to have fun. But you got to understand there's a right way and a wrong way. And you have to be able to accept it. They actually practice, you know, uh, in my it's uh, they real, they're real big on students leading students. So we have to train that with the students like, here's the language you use, here's what's appropriate, what's not appropriate, and they give each other feedback. And that's also helps with them creating kind of a community with percussion. Um, but you know, they don't know what they're getting into, even when you, you know, are letting them know those little details. So I'm just trying to make sure I'm being as clear as possible. Um, and you know, along with, like you were saying with the YouTube channel that I've put together, I mean that was all done by necess necessity. I never <laughs> made a video uh, until, you know, all this COVID stuff started happening. Um, and so it's been, yeah, I mean, we, I, I'm sure all of us have learned a new skill set <laughs> during this uh, quarantine and COVID uh, protocol. So it's uh, definitely something, you know, I mean, we'll get to this later for your students, but I think the power of video is something I really underestimated for a long time. This is my almost my 17th year teaching and I just now started making video, you know? And um, so I think that's real important that we, you know, you start to, why not? You know, we have the technology yeah. so much easier now. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, this, this what we're doing right now is an outgrowth of all of this experience that we've had with, you know, I mean, we've had more guests more guest artists into our percussion studio class this year than we've ever had. And I mean, we had people from all over the, you know, all over the planet come, you know, zoom in for our uh, studio class. And uh, I mean, we're, we're not, uh, you know, you guys aren't that far away, but, you know, getting three, uh, you know, educators like this with, with such great insight and experience to, uh, you know, to my students has been much harder in the past because not, you know, it's just, and the scheduling and all of that too, but the the technology has been a huge huge difference this this year. And like you said, yeah, we all I think we've all learned a new skill set. I, I certainly have. Um, well, okay, Andres, thank you so much. That that's really great. Um, I, I just some of the couple of things that I pulled from your your video were things like accepting feedback, developing social skills, uh, thinking about being detail oriented. Uh, working as a member of a team, all of those things. And, and like you said, it's kind of like you're teaching the whole person, not just, you know, a a musician. You're you're working the whole person, and that, that's really, really great. Um, okay, let's hear from uh, Christina. Do you have uh, any input on this one? Yeah, uh, mine's a little bit different, um, but with my high schoolers, I noticed when I started at Abilene um, that my drumline kids understood that the battery was the drumline and the pit was not even like part of that. Um, and to me, that's kind of sad because I was in pit in high school and I was like, hey, I wanted to be part of the drumline too. So I've tried really hard over the last few years to make sure that we understand that the pit and the battery are together, they're one, and they are the drumline together. But because even then, we have to make sure we're not better than the band, even though we may put more time in or work on more rehearsals or whatever the case may be, we are not better, but we're giving the band something and the band is also giving us something. So that is a good mentality thing to understand and I think it's it's kind of hard for high schoolers to do that and it's it's hard for middle schoolers to understand like we are part of a team and not one of us is better you know so um I, I think that's been really important for us yeah that's great you know what's interesting one of the things that um one of the things that's different about 
at the college level is, you know, I have all of these students who were leaders in their high school band programs, you know, and uh, coming in and um, there's the competition angle is not there, you know. So I, I, I like the idea that, that, that these, uh, you know, the students can come together as the pit and the, the front ensemble and the, the drum line can come together as a member of a team. Uh, and but there is that that competition angle too that it's them you know going to the band contest and that part when that part is removed uh, it, there's a little adjustment there that music's actually not a competition guys you know I mean we have uh, we have competition in the studio for placements and ensembles and that kind of thing but that's more of a you know um, well it's not the same you know it's not an external thing it's an internal thing. Can I add something um, yeah, off of what Christina was saying? Because I think that's that's so important. What I try to tell my my drum line all the time is what I learned early on teaching was again my my focus was drum line because that was my strength. Uh, and then I as my front ensembles got better, and I, as I became a better front ensemble teacher, um, I actually started having a little more fun teaching the front ensemble. Um, now, I also try to make sure the drum line understands we cannot succeed without a good front ensemble. Um, but there was one year where my drum line was just really finally coming into their own and Alvin, after years and years of really trying to bring them up, and my front ensemble was mediocre. And, you know, we weren't happy with our drum scores. The next year, the drum line was almost at the exact same level, and the front ensemble was so much better. And that's when the magic started happening, right? And I think, so, I mean, I, I knew these things, but I try to make sure that the language I use and the way I speak of the front ensemble, all these little things they're hearing from, from sixth grade and on, um, that, they're, that I make sure they're equal footing, like the, even the audition process. If you're auditioning for drumline, even if you're a vet, you have to play your core scales and your core two mallet fundamentals, all right? You don't have to do the four mallet stuff if you're not gonna you try for vibraphone or marimba. But the, the keyboard is always uh, the first door you have to enter, even if you're a drumline vet. I don't care. And everybody has to rotate. I don't care if you've been on snare drum three years. You, in, in auditions, there's a front ensemble room. There's a drumline room. You know, there's a, and we have snare and tenors, and we have the seniors help. But it's a rotation, right? Uh, a lot of programs, sometimes they treat, they call it a drumline audition, like I did for a long time. No, 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 this is a fall marching percussion audition, right? And so, and they treat it like that. It's a drum audition. So basically the best make the drum line, the scraps go to the front ensemble. Now, some of that's gonna happen naturally because you know, freshmen don't know how to march, but I try to make sure they're set up for that. If they want, if they're, you have those go-getters go that really wanna make drum line their first year, I, I try to set up those things for them. But I think that, yeah, I think uh, what Christina's saying is so important that uh, you know, we can't do it without a good front ensemble. And having a, a good front ensemble is really fun for the kids and the teacher. You know, I, I, yeah. I, I love my drumline. My drumline is really great, but it's, I have so much more fun with the front ensemble, honestly. <laughs> honestly, yeah, it's, they're, they're a fun group every year almost. Well, and Andre, I can just add something. I think what you were saying also telling kids from the time they're in sixth grade, like just the language that we use is so important for them to understand that we don't think one is better than the other, even though I'm with you, I have way more fun working with the front ensemble. Um, and it makes all the difference when they can play all their scales and they can play all these things in different keys. And it makes it so much more fun when they can do that. But um, that's what I always tell my kids too. I'm like, guys, the pit plays hard stuff. Like you have no idea what you're about to get into. And they finally realize that I think once they're in it, but I, I think that language is very important. Yeah. And giving the mo giving front ensemble moments to shine, right? We have our warm up program in the show or whatever. But I mean, when I went and taught in Colts in 09, I started saying, hey, you could do these lot jams that are really hip and cool. And maybe you play drum set with them. And, and you know, what's your favorite song? You know, like one year at Alvin, uh, that's the the summer of 21 Pilots when they were in big with Ride. So I arranged Ride. And I mean, that one song totally changed the vibe with the front ensemble. Everybody thought the front ensemble was cool. And like, I even had a couple of moments where the drumline members were like, oh man, I miss being in front ensemble. And they would say it out loud. You know, and give them their, their, their moment to be a rock star, you know. 
Great. Um, Tyler, haven't heard yeah. from you yet. Um, I, these guys are, are just given such great info to kind of piggyback on the band mentality thing. I often tell my, my sixth grade parents, you know, what you're getting into is more akin to like a select soccer team than it is to piano lessons. Um, there's a group mentality that's sort of always there. And while you're, you know, you're getting better at an instrument, that similarity to piano lessons is there, but really the, uh, the ask of what we are asking outside of school and, and um, at, when you're at home practicing is more in line, at least in my community with what those soccer, uh, select soccer clubs or select ice hockey or whatever it is. Um, and so that sort of changes a lot of perspectives. I think a lot of parents just kind of put their kid in band going, oh, great, they'll learn you know, how to play with their friends and, and have like a, a little band and they don't really understand exactly what it is. And, um, you know, and having a sort of a connection and, and high school students that can always speak to those sixth graders and sixth grade parents has been so beneficial. Um, you know, we have a couple of kids that are on the, uh, in the NHS here at, at Westlake and, and they're in their top of their class and, and having them speak to the sixth grade parents as well as student athletes. We have some soccer players and and so that can kind of frame what the parents expect for their kid. And, and uh, you know, I always like to encourage them to be diverse in what they're interested in high school. Um, I always try to, to let them have room for one other thing to do, at least in their schedule, whether it be a sport or whether it be, uh, you know, another fine art or just another interest. Because, um, you know, we as professionals, we have our own interests outside of this, too. And so it's a little bit um, short-sighted, I think, just to kind of, um, expect them to be all in on this one thing. Um, and then, you know, to piggyback on um, what Christina was saying, I like to make sure that each time I have a freshman class come in that I don't just automatically take the best players and kind of throw them into the battery because I know they'll, they'll be quicker to learn to mark time and they'll be quicker. Um, you know, nowadays, I, um, if you're at a 5A or 6A high school in Texas, the judging for UIL now has a percussion caption. So if you don't have your some of your best players in your front ensemble, you're going to miss a lot of opportunity because that judge is not going to be getting out past the back sideline. They're going to be standing in front of your front ensemble. Um, and one other recruiting tactic that's been really helpful in recent years with the front ensemble is the addition of electronics because that's a more uh, useful skill, arguably, than learning how to march um, and crab step across the field, like learning how to manipulate um, main stage and, and uh, use programs like that is actually really useful and, and something that kids can, can really um, get interested in and it kind of feeds multifaceted parts of their brain and instead of just here's the, the drum, you know. So I've had a lot of success getting kids interested just because of the electronics and we've, you know, recently we've invested a lot into that and, and I think the general percussion uh, mentality is like to resist a little bit when it comes to those sort of things. But I've found more, uh, more benefit in just kind of adapting and just saying like, yeah, we, Oh, you, the Pearl Mallet station. Sure. Yeah. We'll use it. We'll find a way to incorporate that. And it's, it's been able to, you know, expand what we can do and how we can sound on the field and also just give the kids and families another facet of things that we're learning. That's actually no, a great, that, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Andre. All right. <laughs> sorry. I love Don't talking worry. about percussion. All right, so two, two things I have, just piggybacking off what Tyler says as I'm thinking through what your college students need to hear if they're getting into this, this game here. Um, one, the front ensemble, I also try to make sure they understand that it's okay if you want to stay, it's okay to be in pit all four years. I say, if you want to make stair line or bass, if we want to make those dreams come true, you let me know, we'll work on it on the off season. But it is totally fine for us to have Hey, I'm pit for life. Let's let's do this. And I, we got to have those members that are pit forever, man. Like, and so I kind of hype that. Like, that's okay to to have that mentality and make sure they don't feel like there's some pressure that they have to move on up to some high, kind of hierarchy. I always tell my students in any capacity, if you if you think everything is on equal footing, right? Anything, not even just music, right? Um, and then as far as recruit recruiting thing, um, that Tyler was also talking about. Uh, if I want to get real with some of this stuff, um, a lot of these students will, will always have that moment where they question whether they're going to quit band or not. I even did, right? Maybe you guys have your own story, right? And I try to tell them that's the big elephant in the room. Hey, 
this is something we should talk about out loud. Everybody has that moment that always make me a part of that conversation. And then also for the parents, when they audition as, a, you know, fifth grade, you know, when they're coming in as fifth graders, I'm looking those parents in the eye and then I'm trying to beat it with a dead horse with these videos and reiterating it as much as I can. You have to be able to do band and academics. It can't be, oh, once we get to your sophomore year, we got to focus on college and all that kind of stuff. I, I already need, you need to hear from me right away that you got to be able to do both. We're not going to play that game, right? And they might still pull the rug out from underneath you. You can tell I've been burned a couple of times, right? Um, but at least they've heard it 10 times, right? And, and then also you're getting, hopefully you're getting the right kind of kids into the program and you're going, and the other ones that are on the fence are, you know, we don't have to go through that, you know, and, and, and change our mind uh, at a bad time. So, I mean, it's also, it's a lot harder to get into college now. So the pressure is on these students um, and these parents also are trying to keep up with the Joneses and, and they're trying to make sure their kids are getting into good colleges and, you know, just trying to put into place where they're understanding that colleges are also looking at your band experience. They know if you started, you committed yourself for seven years to an entity and they know the band kids are already the hardworking, most hardworking kids in the school. And they're, they're dedicating themselves to a group. There's leadership opportunities. It's like the, to me, the band is the biggest microcosm of, you know, the real world that you can have before you get into the real world, right? And so trying to get the parents to get that mindset a little bit earlier, instead of just thinking it's all about the GPA or the SAT scores, everybody's going to have those high scores, but they're going to see those extra things too. And I think, you know, if the, if the students and, and the parents are hearing that band is going to separate you, Maybe they can think of it as a positive and not a negative because it is a lot of time, but you can't avoid growing up. You can't avoid maturing. You can't avoid um, learning how to manage your time as you get older. You know, a lot of it's based on fear out of the parents or the students. When I tried to quit, it was based on fear, right? And luckily I had a parent to go, okay, that's nice. I heard you, but you're staying in band, right? And honestly, right, sometimes you have parents that will go, it's their decision. Like we got to guide them. They're still high schoolers. We, that's great. We're trying to make them independent, but we got to guide them a little bit too. It can't just be whatever they want. So I'm trying to get those kind of things to echo in their ear from the beginning and throughout. So. Great. Thank you. That, that, that was a great topic. We lot, lots of different directions in that one. Thank you guys. That was great. Um, all right, so the next one is is really more for my students, and um, I, I've asked this one in one of the other ones, but I always get interesting responses, so I, I want to throw this one out there, is that if you could go back to your undergraduate self, think about your junior or senior year of your undergraduate days, <laughs> I see some looks of recognition there, and, um, and give advice to yourself about, you know, um, your education or... Uh, you know, what it takes to get a job. You could take this in any direction you want, but if you could go back and give yourself some advice, say in your junior or senior year, what would that be? How about, let's start with Christina. Um, I have several. So um, w probably the first thing I would do would be to learn more about electronics, just because I, there was no classes on that at BYU for me to take. And when I got to Abilene, that was the hardest thing to do. We've, we finally just got a Pearl Mallet station and I'm so thankful for that. And we finally got a new mixer. So, but that, that is something that is like Tyler said, um, we, we have to like really get going on the electronics and understand how to make it work. And that's half the battle in the front ensemble, um, especially. And then also I would make sure that I would really try harder on drum set um, for my core. Uh, drum set was always really hard for me. And now I do a steel band at the school. Um, that was part of my requirements as one of my school classes. So I teach a steel band and I'm the drum set player in that band um, just because most of my students don't have the drum set experience. Um, 
but playing drum set every day just for 30 minutes with them has made me so much better. And I think that is really important for college students to understand. Like you really do have to be well-rounded in all areas of percussion, even the ones that you may think are harder or you may not like as much. Um, and probably like learn more about jazz band as well, because that's something I don't have the experience on, and that would probably help. Wow, that is great. And I hope my students are listening to that because drum set is part of our curriculum here at Sam Houston State. Every student has to study drum set. It's built in. It's part of the upper level barrier that they have to do in their sophomore year. And I definitely have a lot of students who come in with no drum set experience, but I definitely make them do it. <laughs> and sometimes they don't always appreciate it. So thank you for <laughs> saying that. That's that great. All right. Uh, let's see. How about uh, let's go Tyler. Um, the drum set thing, I'll, I'll echo that, you know, when I went to North Texas, we had an expansive drum set curriculum and it really kicked my butt in college. And, um, and then I ended up getting a job at a school like Westlake, where we had the, the, uh, honor jazz ensemble for Texas last year. And so I kind of was thrown in like, okay, you got to teach these kids how to play drum set. And luckily, you know, with not only my education, but my network of people that I knew from college that it was like, okay, I know this guy can come in and do like a master class with my kids. And that, that will be super beneficial. That was really helpful. Um, and then my other piece of advice to myself back then would have just been, don't be in such a hurry to get out of that environment. You know, I think when you're a junior or senior in college, it can be really tempting. And I would imagine more so now with COVID and how everything's been going, to say, oh, I got to hurry up and get these classes over with so I can start my career. Um, you know, I, I think through my involvement in DCI um, and in the ensembles at North Texas, I didn't really realize at the time what I was learning and that I was learning how to do my job in those, in those wind ensemble rehearsals, in those drum corps rehearsals that I was so like, okay, I got to get this done so I can move on to the next thing and be a staff member and be a, a band director and all of that. And um, you know, if I just would have been able to focus more on my own playing in that time and had the, the, the insight to be able to think, okay, I need to invest in myself more right now instead of constantly seeking my exit strategy from this environment. I need to really be in the environment and, and get as much as I can out of my professors while I'm here. That would be my biggest advice to myself uh, for sure. Uh, that's so great. Uh, thank you for that. that. That's that's really really great. Um, a lot of a lot of times that happens with, especially the you know really talented students, and they they get contacted by a local school and to go be a a tech of the marching band or something, and all of a sudden they're coming to me and saying, well, I got this, you know, I'm teaching at such and such school, and can I miss my percussion ensemble rehearsal? I'm like, no, you gotta be, you gotta be here, you know. So some some students get that kind of one foot out the door idea too so that that's really great thank you for that i appreciate that <laughs> okay andres yeah uh, again with drum set drum set is something i have played since middle school and i really enjoyed that that was a good outlet for me i i do know that some percussionists don't aren't really drawn to that but it does give you flexibility uh, with you know there are a lot of like simple exercises that i do with my students but i'll throw it you know a drum set track in the background and make it more fun for them um, and then a lot of students, they're not going to go and get a Murma gig, you know, when they graduate, you know, drum set's going to be our most pliable instrument. And so uh, we'll get into the percussion ensemble stuff, uh, in a, I'm sure later on, but um, there are some philosophies I have with that. But, oh, man, uh, yeah, as far as college goes, um, things that I would tell myself, I mean, a lot, so I'll try to keep it short here. But, um, yeah, I never got to do steel pan. Uh, I was in a, like a jazz uh, theory class, and but I didn't really do too much with that. I wish I would have learned more about that. So obviously try to just, you know, dabble in everything. Um, and that's not only going to help you, you, you as a well-rounded player, but you're networking too. And, and, and networking is the next thing I would tell myself. Um, I don't know. I was always one of those uh, kind of students like in high school and in, in college. I didn't, I didn't really go to a lot of parties. Like I didn't really try to you know, I was kind of, you know, I was very focused. Um, and I would have told myself, go have more fun because it's networking. You hear networking, make sure you're networking. That sounds like such a chore, but really it's just who are you hanging out with and not just percussionists, hang out with the wind players, talk to the people that you think, you know, um, you don't really talk to that much. So maybe you should you know, broaden yourself and try to engage them. 
uh, ask more questions than, than you know, talking about yourself. You already know about yourself. You're going to learn more about hearing other people's experiences. And, uh, you know, I would have maybe, you know, um, tried to be a part of more social groups um, if I would have gone back and done it again and just understand that those, those people, I guess, you know, what it all comes down to is when I, I kind of, I was in Trump four. Um, and the one thing I learned was there's a good, there's one good thing about drum court, it helps your confidence. There's another bad thing about drum court, it helps your confidence. And so I was like, Mr. Cavaliers. And I, I thought, you know, I don't, I wasn't that bad, but I probably thought I was better than everybody, you know? And so I didn't, I'm not going to hang out with those people. I'm going to hang out with my drum court people. And that was, that was a big mistake. And that really set up my mentality incorrectly with a lot of interactions I had. And some of those people that I thought were beneath me, like they become somebody someday. Wind players, your you know, percussionists that you're better than right now, they will become the CEOs of Yamaha or whatever, or they're going to be in your job interview. You or your principal. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So you, it, you need to not only, you know, try to reach out to people that you wouldn't usually get out of your comfort zone. But be nice to everybody because they're going to be somebody someday. And not that it's about getting what you need to get from them, but yeah, that's your network right there is that how much you reach outside of yourself and how you treat other people. Uh, and so, yeah, I just, you know, I, 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 kept, I always kept things very close. I should have, you know, tried a little harder to broaden um, in that way socially. Yeah, that's that's great advice. That's really, really great. Well, um, this it sort of segues then, since you brought that up, it sort of segues into one of the other questions that came up, which is, you know, I often with my students, we have this conversation. And again, it's it's uh, it's sort of like making sure that everything's in balance with what they're doing when they're in college uh, about DCI or WGI. And I always have, a, you know, a cadre of students that that want to do that and are real heavily involved. And then I have some that you know, they're just, maybe they're not quite there yet or something, and they're not as interested in it, uh, in, in the DCI, WGI activities, or they can't afford it. I mean, there's some students that just simply can't afford to do it. It's, it's expensive. It's way more expensive than when I did it, you know, and th the landscape is just so much, so different now. Um, so I guess my question is, uh, and, and the questions that students have is, you know, what, what sort of emphasis is placed on that in the job market here in Texas? If students are applying for jobs, like how much is it um, looked at that your percussion person has some uh, line on on their resume that says DCI or WGI? And um, yeah, I think I think it can be kind of open ended from there. And and I guess what I would also say, say is that what I usually tell my students is. Um, that this is a kind of street cred that is helpful to have, but it's not essential to have. And um, because I told him, you know, I, I marched Cavaliers in 2000. I was on the snare line. We had a fantastic year. I learned a amazing amount. And, and it's to this day, a, a, you know, a really great experience that I can uh, draw on in my own teaching and all of that. But, um, that didn't necessarily get me into my uh, doctoral degree. It, it didn't get me the job at Sam Houston State when I applied here, but it was a line on my resume that showed sort of that street cred. So I, so I tell my students that. That's sort of the way I talk about it. I say, you know, go, go do it. If you're interested in it and you're, you're into it, go do it for a year, you know, uh, or maybe two years. But you don't need to do it all four years that you're in school, you know. Uh, so anyway, I, I've talked enough. Let me get into <laughs> to what you guys think. Uh, Andre, since you mentioned it, maybe you, you could want to lead us off on this one. Yeah. And, and shout out to the, your Cavaliers 2000 line. Uh, <laughs> uh, that, that line there like, totally changed my path. I, I, once I saw the 2000 line, I think you were rocking the goatee at the time. Oh, I had the goatee. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, when I saw that, I was like, I'm going to the Cavaliers. So, uh, <laughs> Shout out to 2000, changed a uh, major impact in my life, that, that line. So what a year to, to march. But I would say, um, although, I, I mean, I have plenty of, of uh, influencers that I, I talked to, and some did march drum corps, and, but they give me my best advice with certain aspects of what I'm trying to learn. 
think I heard Jamie in the in episode two talk about this. It's get to the drum core WGI level that you can, and you know whatever you can achieve, and just show that you that you tried. Um, but I don't think it's a deal breaker. I think it's more about your reputation. I've had former students um, that don't have any WGI or uh, DCI experience, but they're reliable. I know they're going to be there. I know they're going to be education first, and they're going to treat the kids with respect, and they're going there and that's why i keep picking up the phone and calling them hey can you can you because i can rely on them um it you know it is uh it is not you know something i do look for you know when i'm looking for texts but you know i if some of your texts are going hey this this guy didn't march uh drum corps or whatever but you know he's a great teacher educator that's going to ring more true in my ears is hearing their reputation but you know if it's one of those things where you're just unsure about it and it's just a comfort thing and just go to a camp and see, you know, how you're feeling after the camp. Cause a lot of these things are kind of blending right now where it's not just like a drum core mindset and a concert mindset. It's kind of, you know, we're kind of getting to, into the same level here. So um, it's important, but it's not everything. Cool. Um, Tyler. Yeah, um, what you just said, Andres, about making like that, how they're sort of merging the concert side of things and the DCI side of things. That was my experience in drum corps. Um, you know, I went to UNT and one of my professors there was Paul Rinnick. And so I got sort of wrapped up into his drum lines at the time at Phantom Regiment. And I did that for uh, three years. And then right when I aged out, he went to SCB and I got involved with that. And that, I've been doing that now for 11 years teaching there, which makes me feel really old. But, um, <clears throat> you know, I, I don't think that if I would have been a part of a different group that I would have invested or found the value in what I'm doing than I, than, you know, than I did at, at Phantom and Vanguard. It just depends on, it's so different, right? It's, it's like you have all these options of summer camps to go to as well. And, and the drum corps thing, I sort of look at it the same way, find a group that you find you know not don't just go to any group and say I, I need to get this on my resume make sure that there's there's a reason you want to go to that group and and uh and the best way to find out about groups is to ask the people in them and, and say hey you know i know um you marched the blue coats can you tell me how was your experience there like what were the teachers like and and that word of mouth can go a long way and and really making sure that you get the most out of your experience and um but i you know I, I hate to say this because I don't want to think people to think that I am like a drum corps all all being person, but I do notice whenever I see job postings that almost a hundred percent of the time they say we're looking for someone with this experience. And so I think in Texas, especially, uh, that is the case. You know, I taught in Illinois uh, at Marion Catholic High School, which is a BOA band, and, and we did that whole scene, but not everyone that taught at Marion Catholic was a drum corps person. I mean, we had people on our marching band staff that were in the Chicago Civic Orchestra, and then they just, this was just a thing that they did, and they taught lessons at our school, and and those teachers were just as valuable to our process as any person that marched Blue Devils for eight years and can really, you know, teach, teach the kids. So I, I don't think there's an inherent value that you gain just simply by doing it, um, but I think the, the narrative right now, sadly, a little bit in Texas is that you sort of need that experience. And if you don't, you, you need people to vouch for you and know you. And, and I've just, I've learned that drum corps is a great network for me. Um, <clears throat> you know, I've, I've been fortunate enough to be involved for, for a long time now. And so, um, often whenever I apply for a job or I meet somebody new, they go to those drum corps people to find out, you know, you've spent a lot of time with Tyler. What's he like? And, and so I found it to be really useful to me. Um, but that being said, I think it's really short sighted of programs, honestly, to, to not to put that in their, in their job search, but to require that and to not give anyone an interview um, simply because they don't have that on their resume. I think, I think at the best programs and, and ones that are really worth investing time into that's, they'll be able to see, okay, this person has, maybe they didn't do drum corps, but they did Tanglewood for three years and they did Bang on a Can Festival and they, they did the Lee Howard Stevens seminar. So, you know, it depends on what the directors are trying to get out of their program. Um, I think to me, the best is to have all of those, th those experiences and to just get as much out of it. That's kind of goes back to what I was saying about don't rush out of, of school, you know, 
uh, you can still go to those clinics. If you say you do your age out of drum corps, well, the next summer, go to a, go to a clinic, your resume, having something on it that makes you stick out in Texas is, is huge. So not just drum corps, but all kinds of things. Great. Thank you. Christina? Yeah, um, I didn't march drum corps, so I'm the odd one out here, but um, I actually this year got on the staff for Compass Drum and Bugle Corps. Um, so I'm working with the front ensemble. I'm one of their techs this year, um, and I'm really good friends with the people who kind of started that. And so that's kind of how I got into that. So again, with the networking, that's really important. Um, and I did want to try to give it a try this year. So I, I think it's kind of cool to start that. Um, kind of to echo what Andres and uh, Tyler said, um, I don't think it is everything, but I do feel like if I had done it at least one year in college, I think I would have learned some more things. Um, but at the time in college, I was also more interested in doing like classical percussion things and more steel band. And um, I went to the Chosen Veil seminar. Um, and so that was a really good experience. Got to meet like Michael Burrett and Nancy Zeltzman and Ivan Trevino. And so that was an, also a really good experience. And so kind of what they're saying, like it would be helpful and um, a really good experience just like Chosen Vale or Lee Howard Stevens or any of those camps. But at the same time, I don't think it's necessary. Um, and I was actually told by one of my professors that I would never get hired if I didn't have DCI experience. Um, but I don't, I don't think that's the case, obviously, cause I am, <laughs> I am employed right now. So, um, I, I, I do think it's good. I don't think it's necessary or required. Um, but again, just being well-rounded, like, um, knowing how to do jazz and classical and steel band and marching and all of those things, it's just very important for our craft. And I think it's one of the only, um, jobs and, uh, kind of one of the only instruments that we can be that well-rounded in. Everyone else just kind of focuses on one instrument and we have so many that we get to choose from. So I think that's more important to understand. Yeah, that's great. I, I think what I'm hearing a lot of you say too is that um, the, the DCI, WGI thing is important but not essential necessarily. But also I liked what, uh, what Tyler said and Christina, you're a great example of this, is you need to do something outside of your wherever you're going to school, uh, something extracurricular, a summer festival, uh, some experience that that helps you you to stand out from those other applicants that maybe just played in their undergraduate wind ensemble and, and that was it. Uh, am I am I sort of getting that that vibe from everybody? I'm seeing head nods. So yeah, that's that that's great. That's great. Um, okay, we've got about uh, uh, 10 12 minutes left here in the hour. Uh, the last questions that came up were really about beginners. And uh, Christine, I know you just presented on this topic at TMEA, so maybe you want to lead us off. And I'll, I'll just leave it completely open. Um, but anything, in, any issues dealing with beginners? It could be how you structure your classroom or your lesson plans, or you know, if you're teaching snare and mallets concurrently, or you teach one first, or what books you use. <laughs> Completely open-ended, uh, but let's let's go around with that. And Christina, since you're fresh off the TMEA presentation, why don't you lead off on this one? Um, so I think with this, I obviously could talk forever, um, but I actually love teaching beginners. I think that's probably my favorite thing about my job um, because it's really cool to have those light bulb moments with the kids and see like they actually understand what I just said to them. That's really great. Um, I will tell you, and since this is geared towards students, um, your very first year, they're not going to understand everything you're saying. You're not going to be able to explain everything the right way. And maybe the thing you said first doesn't make sense. And I had to try to troubleshoot and try to figure out what I said that didn't make sense um, to them the first time. And then I went home and like, well, how did I learn this? I don't remember when I was 11 years old. So I, I had to like go back to the drawing board several times and just try to figure that out. Um, I also think it's really important for college students to find those people. I know we keep saying networking over and over and over again, but find those people who have a job in Texas already, who have a job at a school you might want to work at in the future and email them. Just ask them 
hey, what do you do for your beginner class? What book do you use? What is your um, idea and your philosophy on X, Y, and Z? And I think that is one of the biggest things. Um, in Abilene, we actually have two other high schools and both of those percussion directors, I'm really good friends with them. And so my very first two years, I asked them tons of questions all the time just because I didn't know. And those are things you don't necessarily learn in college. So I think it's important to find that. Um, and then I would also just on your own, try to figure out uh, what your personal philosophy is and maybe things that you think are the most important to teach middle school percussionists, because I tried to get through the first, the whole book the first year, and obviously that does not work. Um, and sometimes classes go way slower and sometimes they go really fast. So it, it just really depends. Um, and there's so many factors for that, right? So. Um, just trying to figure out like certain things I know for a fact that my top snare drum thing for my kids is learning how to open roll because when I showed up in Abilene, my kids couldn't do that. Like I, I was amazed that they just didn't understand what a roll was. And so um, that's one of the things I'm like very adamant about. And then also mallets. Um, that's a whole nother topic, but um, <laughs> mallets is just rough for sixth graders and they don't quite get it and it's always a dreadful day when we work on mallets because they just don't want to and so I think trying to figure out the best way to teach that or make it fun or just try to say things over and over again to them hey mallets is fun you can do all these cool things for them um, and I end up actually teaching four mallets to my kids in seventh grade um, so I think that's been also very helpful. And then I'll, I'll play little four mallet songs for my sixth graders and say, Hey, once you learn four mallets and, or, and even two mallets, once you learn how to read your stuff, then you can get into this really cool stuff and you want to be able to play that at some point. So I, that's the minimal amount I'm going to say on this, but yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's great. Do you, uh, I had just a f quick follow-up for Christina. Do you, uh, and maybe you, you guys could also chime in on this. Do you look for, uh, like when you're recruiting for sixth grade band, are you looking for percussionists that have a uh, piano background? Is that something that you try to have happen or, or is that something at all? Is that a thing? Yeah. I mean, it kind of depends. Um, I don't think it's a requirement because some of my very best kids never had piano experience. Um, I was one that did have piano experience. So I always ask the question and ask if they do have it. And that's kind of like a little bit of an extra credit on my little testing that I do with them. Okay, great. Thank you. Oops. Yeah, uh, yeah. Let's, uh, I was just yeah, going to add um, to that, like, uh, with beginners too, I, I think there's always a, when you're a young teacher, this, um, this thought that you should sort of come up with your own curriculum and you should, you should be the one in charge of what you're teaching them. And it took me a year or two to really learn. There's some really great textbooks out there that have been designed by industry leaders and, and Mark Wessels and, and, uh, Ken and Wiley come to mind and, uh, and, you know, they're putting their good stuff in the book. And once I, I kind of, learned how to like use the book to help me get through the class I thought my kids just started playing better and better and you know you always it's 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 tempting to say okay like my first year I was like okay we I want my kids to be really great at flams and rolls and so to introduce that earlier so they'll be better that's just not the, the sequencing behind it is so well thought out by everyone that's come before you it's 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 tempting to do that but it's it's always led me into a better direction when I just use those books and and i think about why they introduce flams at a certain point and paradiddles at a certain point and um that has been a savior for me i mean i my first teaching uh gig in texas was in, at prosper high school which is a large uh suburb of dallas and i had 26 beginners in a weight room uh like a, a weight lifting weights <laughs> and it was really long and so the farthest away kid was like i don't know like 50 feet away from me and so it was just a big room and i I remember like just thinking halfway through the year, like, what have I done? These kids have no knowledge about anything. I was, I was honestly embarrassed. And then uh, I talked to, uh, you know, there's so many great teachers in the Dallas area, high school teachers that have mastered the game of, of percussion. And so I remember talking to Ken and Wiley and he was like, you know, I wrote the book in that order for a reason. And so I just thought to myself, why do I, well, how arrogant of me to think I knew a better way to do this than, <laughs> than these guys. So uh, that has been a huge benefit to me in teaching beginners. Uh, great, great. Andres? 
I have another Ken and Wiley story. And Christina, was that your teacher? Yeah, I went to Marcus. So yeah, yeah. Say, yeah. okay. Yeah. So yeah, I was using the I was using the Wiley book uh, my first two years, and there was a lot of great stuff in there. But then I was also approaching beginners like mini drumline members, and I was just trying to do way too much. And so I learned, you know, early on, keep it simple. Um, but what I think the thing that saved me, I always tell myself, this saved me seven years of trial and error. Uh, my third year teaching, I just went, man, let me just email Kenan and see if I can just come observe him. And it happened to be our spring breaks didn't align. So he was on school when I was off. So I said, can I please drive up? To and of course, Kenan being the way he is, yeah, come on down. Yeah. So I drove four hours and observed him the whole day and then drove my butt back to Houston. But um, that's it. I mean, I, it was watching his classes, but then I like asked him questions for two hours and just took notes. And that just saved me seven years of just trial and error. And I, I, eventually I adapted things to make it work for my student clientele and, and my personality and my strengths and weaknesses. But reaching out to the Wileys of the world and Jeff Osdemores, that, and then some of my colleagues like Heath Dillard, um, who's just amazing at teaching from sixth grade and middle school all the way to high school, just reaching out to those, those people. Cause like, I was a good player, but I had great teachers, but I was not a part of a Louisville ISD type setting. So I knew how to, how I got good, but I didn't know what a good beginner program looked like, or even even the drum line stuff. Like I marched Cavaliers, but I was I don't that's not the drum. You know, high school is not drum corps, and so what? How do you keep it more simple? How do you make it more fun? You know, and and uh, yeah. So I mean, just reaching out to people, and um, you know, even like with my percussion ensembles, just I learned um, I wanted to have some guest artists out, and I wanted to reach out to Lalo Davila, and I was a little nervous to call him, but he said, Oh yeah, oh, oh, of course. I'll, I'll come play with your kids and like just asking like go for it <laughs> ask these people they're big names they're celebrities in your mind but they're educators and they love you know you know they always have given so much to our idiom so of course they're gonna they're gonna <laughs> they're gonna be nice and they're gonna help you out all right uh man this was this was really terrific you guys thank you so much for being here I want to extend an invitation to all, any of you who would like to come back and do a clinic or something for my students, especially once we get back uh, in person. But but this format is great, too. I, I'd love to have uh, we, we could talk for another hour about about all of this stuff. So and I know even beginners, we could probably do a whole episode on just teaching beginners. Maybe we should do that. But um, anyway, just wanted to say again, thank you, Andres, Christina, Tyler. Thank you so much for doing this. Uh, and uh, I'll get this out on on the YouTube soon and uh, and we and please share with your your friends and colleagues and again just thank you so much virtual round of applause for all of you all right